There are a lot of super annoying things in the world. Banging your toe against the sofa when you're just trying to get to bed, running out of ice cream late at night, running out of coffee the morning after you run about out of ice cream. These are all incredibly frustrating things, but there is perhaps nothing more frustrating than trying to develop software with the Windows API. Go ahead and run this command, there we go. Um, so it received an attempt to download the malware, everything ran, and as you can see, our background changed to something from Dingboard, um, the default from Dingboard, in fact. That includes writing malware. And today we're going to talk a little bit about why writing malware in the Windows or on the Windows API is really annoying. And we are going to talk a bit about how I'm kind of getting around some of those problems and grokking my mind around it as I start writing Rust malware again. So first off, let's talk about why it's annoying. So Rust has this idea or this approach where basically do not touch memory. Now there's a bunch of other things below that and a lot of other reasons behind that um, that I'm not going to get into because people have already talked at length about why memory safety bugs are a big problem. I mean, hell, the, the White House talked about memory safety bugs. So, I mean, it, you can tell that it's an actual thing. They don't talk about anything. Um, but when we're talking about Rust, the reason why a lot of people, especially people in critical applications like healthcare and things like that, have started moving over to Rust is because Rust takes the approach of we should never directly touch memory. That does not mean that you can't. When Rust says you cannot touch memory, it really means the default of this program or the default of this programming language is to avoid allowing you to directly manipulate memory through memory access. That doesn't mean that you can't. They give you the unsafe keyword that you can use to wrap accesses to memory. And everything within the language does allow you to use pointers and memory manipulation and things like that, you just have to go about it a roundabout way. The Windows API is annoying to begin with. When you take the Windows API and the annoyingness of that, and you add on top of that the annoyingness of trying to deal with pointers and memory access and things like that in Rust, you get a pain in the ass. So Windows API function calls. We are going to use a function called foo. Now in a normal programming language or a normal API call, you would do let result equal to API call with param one, param two, param three. Okay, and result, result has the actual return data type of API call. Okay, so if you've ever written a bit of code in your life that deals with functions, you have seen this. Result, if API call returns an integer, result holds that integer. Now, Rust has a different approach. They've got, um, they've got like enums and things like that that you can use to kind of wrap things and you know have error handling and things like that, but this is pseudocode. We're just going to talk about things from a high level. Now, that is a normal normal API call. Let me zoom in just a bit. So that's a normal API call. What Windows does instead, for reasons unbeknownst to me, Windows API call, is you have to create, let, let's do res pointer equal to null pointer. All right, and again, this is pseudocode. This is not legitimate like Rust code or anything. So you've got this null pointer, and then you've got let param one equal to, let's just do foo, not foot, let param two equal to bar, etc. And then you do the Windows API call, and you do let kinda result equal to a win API call, and you're going to pass in pointers to param one, Oh, that's not the ampersand. You're going to pass in pointer to param one, a pointer to param two, and a pointer to res pointer. And what this will actually be to be more accurate is you'll have null, and this will just be res, 
and then you'll have let res pointer equal to null, a pointer to res, sorry. So you've got this, and now you've got just res pointer. So you can see, A, it looks ugly as hell. Oop. So it looks very ugly. Um, it also, you can probably, if you're you know familiar with memory safety issues and you know, you're kind of looking at this, you can probably see the problem. We're doing memory accesses this entire way down. Both of our first two parameters are pointers to memory locations. This right here is not only a pointer to a memory location, but it has to be a mutable memory location that we are going to write into with this function call. That's stupid, it's incredibly opaque, but what makes it even dumber is this kind of result may have null, it may have an integer return type that you've gotta go look up into a table to actually figure out what it is in the Windows API. It's ridiculous. And there's no reason for it to have ever been developed this way. All right, let's dive into the code because that's why everybody's here anyways. Uh, let's see. So, I'm not going to be using NeoVim this time, or I'm not going to be using VS Code, sorry. Um, I know everybody loves VS Code. I am not going to do it anymore because I'm not going to pretend like I actually use it outside of making these videos. So we're gonna do NeoVim into, this is our actual malware client, and this is going to be our malware server. That's right, you get C2 and client all in one today. Um, so I am cross-compiling on Mac over to a Windows target. If you look over here on the right, you see the Windows target. We're gonna be dealing with that here in a bit. Um, and we'll do like a quick code route through before we get there. So let's go to source. Um, I've got it divided up into modules. So the C2 module is what will interact with the C2. The functionary stuff is what's going to actually do the functions of the malware. And we'll talk about that here in a sec. Um, and then we've got the things that deal with the Windows registry. Another thing that we'll talk about in a second. So let's look at the main file and we can kind of walk through the way all of this works. So I've got my C2 hard coded in here because this is a work in progress. Um, we are grabbing the username. I'll show that here in a bit. We're going to ping the C2. Should probably do that first, honestly, but that's okay. Um, we are going to add the malware to startup. So we're getting some, you know, baby's first persistence there. Um, and we are going to change the background. Um, so that is kind of the flow of how everything is working. And to go a little bit more in depth, this ping right here is just sending a ping request um, via HTTP to our C2 server. Um, and then this background change is going to pull a picture down from the C2 and change the background um, to that picture. Let's walk through the registry stuff first because this is where you can really see how annoying everything is. Um, so first what we're doing is we're grabbing the username. Let's make sure that I'm in the right function. Yeah, function get username. Um, so what we're doing here is we are opening up a handle to a registry key. That's another thing that Windows does a lot, which isn't as controversial because registry keys aren't that big or handles to things is, aren't that big of a deal, especially if you only want one copy of that open at a time. It's kind of an easy way to do mutexing. Um, so we're opening up our registry key here. H key current user um, is the root registry key that we're opening up. And then we are going to open up the volatile environment sub registry key. So the way the registry in Windows works is it's essentially like a nested database. So you've got you know root keys and then sub keys that kind of follow like a folder structure and then you actually get down to the value. Um, this is literally, if you look at the Windows API, there are several places where they're just like, we don't use this at all. We don't use this parameter at all. But in order to maintain backwards compatibility with our other shitty operating systems, we're going to require you to pass in that parameter anyway. I'm dead serious. It's literally all over the Windows API. It's the most infuriating thing ever. Um, so that zero means nothing. Um, this key all access is a constant that is used to basically say we want every bit of access, read, write, update, delete. Um, I could have been a little bit more granular with this, but I don't really care. And here's what I was talking about. So we are creating a mutable and essentially null H key here. And we are writing to it using a mutable pointer here. 
I hate that. And this open key res is, I believe it's an integer type, I want to say. Let's see if I can get some open, ooh. open key res equals, I want to say it's an integer type. Let's see if I can get some type hints here. Open key res. Okay, so it's a Win32 error struct, which I believe is just an integer wrapper. It's the stupidest thing ever. Anyways, um, so we've got our mutable reg type. Um, our username, so this username right here is a vector of bytes that we are going to write into. We're following the same exact pattern here. Essentially this pattern is what you're going to continue using. Um, we're going to resize that so that we do in fact have the correct memory location like size. Um, again, you have to manually do that, which is ridiculous. Um, so as long as we don't have an error, we are going to get the value of the H key result slash volatile environment slash username. So that's essentially how this is work. We're, we're following basically a nested folder structure. Um, that's that's what we're looking at here. So the username is what we're hunting for. That is the final key value pair that we're looking for within the registry. Um, so we're going to pull that out. Um, reg routine flags two. Um, I don't know if this is any clearer to y'all as it is to me. That is basically just a string. So that is how Windows talks about strings. Yeah, antiquated as operating system. Um, this reg type, I believe, I can't remember. I think that actually holds the location of the real type of the registry key. So if you're wrong here, they'll write the real type there. Um, and then this is the location that we're trying to write into. And here, this one's really stupid. So we're going to give it a size. So our size is 200. And we have to pass in the location and memory of that size variable so that if we're wrong, it will give us the real size. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you would think all of this software was still written in the 80s and 90s, but, you know, that's how they're still writing it. Um, so we're checking to see if that is null, and we are actually pulling that out of the byte. So we wrote into a byte vector, and now we have to convert it from UTF-8. Um, so we're using a lossy algorithm there so that we don't run into any bugs. Um, so we're printing it out, and we are returning that username string. So if you're following along at home, that is how we are getting our username right up here. Um, then we are pinging the C2. That is significantly more simple. If we go over to our C2 module, ping C2 is literally just sending a get request to our C2 address. We're passing in that C2 address um, within the um, parameters of the function. We're pinging it, and we are making sure that we're getting a 200 response. You know, so that's basic. Um, so that is our ping result. Um, now the startup um, registry edition is essentially, it follows the same kind of like pattern. So if we go back over to registry add startup, we're opening up our handle here. We are making sure that we were able to open it successfully. We are creating a memory location to store the value of the run registry key and the size opening it up and getting the value that's going to basically tell us if we've already run this before um, i would use this as a mutex but i didn't feel like actually writing that logic in yet um, we're truncating it and we are printing out the current value um, so that will basically tell us whether or not we've run um, this malware before then we are actually doing the fun stuff um, so if we go down 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 we are going to actually set the value um, so that H key result is the um, handle to the registry key that we opened before. This is what we're writing out and our byte vec that we are setting. Let's see. Let's do let byte vec. That is the name string converted to bytes. That name string is um, converting that over and then I believe I'm adding to it down here. Let's see. Um, we're getting the name of the module, I'm sorry. Now I'm, now I'm kind of back to it. Um, we're getting the name of the actual running program here. Um, that's another Windows API call um, that's fairly normal. I don't know. Um, basically, we're passing in zero to say this current, um, you know, the currently running program. That's what we want to get the module file name from. And we are storing that within name. 
And then we are truncating name and passing it into legitimate software. Um, that's going to be, basically it's going to allow us to add that as a program that is going to run at startup every single time. Um, making sure that that was set correctly, getting the value of it and then printing it out. So if we go on back to main, that is our add startup res. Now here's where it gets fun. This BG change res, that is in the funk module. Um, we're actually combining lots of different things. So we are pulling down the picture here using request. Um, so we're pulling it down from the C2 address slash download slash logo with a get request. Um, there's no obfuscation going on there. It's just a raw get request. Um, we're writing it out to the current running directory, which is usually downloads, I believe. And then let's see, we are going to hard code the location of that, which is ugly, but it'll do. And we are calling system parameters info A, which is a very ugly wrapper for several different ways to change system parameters within Windows. We are telling it that we want to set the desktop wallpaper and then we are passing in the image buff, which is just the location of the image there. And then we're sending it on. So that is the majority of the functionality. I guess you probably want to see it actually work. Yeah, so that's all of the functionality now that I think about it. Um, the C2 is incredibly simple. In fact, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. That is our background wallpaper that you see there. If we look in the source, we are just creating um, a file path for the malware itself so that it can grab itself um, or I can grab it um, from the server and um, you know pull it down anytime I update it. So that's going to serve the actual piece of malware. Um, this get bg is another endpoint that we're using to serve the background picture. Um, nothing super complex here. The vast majority of this is reading from files and error handling. So that's why I'm kind of skipping over it. That is the ping handler, so that's what actually returns our pings. And here's where we're adding all of the routes and doing our listen. So let's go ahead and cargo run our server. And let's see if I've still got, okay, so we're deleting. Um, if you look over here at the quote unquote victim PC, and this is just a um, VNC connection into my desktop. Um, we're deleting the current version of the malware. We are pulling it down from the C2 and we are running it. So if you look over here, this is our um, malware C2. Nothing super interesting is gonna happen there, but I'll still show you. Go ahead and run this command. Go ahead and run this command, there we go. Um, so it received an attempt to download the malware, everything ran, and as you can see, our background changed to something from Dingboard, um, the default from Dingboard, in fact. Um, so we added to the startup registry key, um, we changed the background picture, and that is where we saved our background picture there. Um, it does not do anything fancy yet. That's okay. I'm gonna do more walkthroughs like this to kind of explain different Windows you know, operating system stuff and kind of explain how it all works. Um, it can get a little bit annoying and tedious, so I'm going to kind of do them sparingly and do more deep walkthroughs of like how everything works in separate videos. So this is kind of the devlog version and we're gonna go into the deeper dives later on. That's about it, take it easy, peace.